Uh, I've known Felix since uh, last century. Uh, <laughs> not, not that he's that old, but I knew him in 1999, even back. Yeah? 98. 98, 98, yes. nine, yeah. So it was last century, actually. Yeah. And he, he came to, first as a poet, you know, and uh, he was, a, at the part of time, he was a, not that he's not one now, but he was a really excellent poet. No, when a I saw struggling him, poet. Right? Struggling poet, yeah. But uh, I was really happy to publish him then. And today, I'm glad to say that uh, he has actually reinvented himself as a fiction writer. He, this is a, a second collection, I think, of short stories. First. First collection of short stories. Uh, and I'm glad to say that, uh, well, he trusted me enough to come back to me again and ask me whether I wanted to publish it. Of course, we struggled a little over the, <laughs> the how a poet could become a fiction writer, you know. But he did very well, and I'm glad that after almost two years. Yes, two yeah, and a half. Two and a half years. The book is now finally out, and I hope you enjoy it. Yeah. Oh, uh, before I forget, the young man on the right, his name is Ryan. This is a father and son tech team. Okay. So I think you're going to enjoy yourself, right? right? Thank you. Thank you. Right. He's a handsome little devil, isn't he? Oh. <laughs> okay, uh, welcome to this book launch. Uh, Felix Cheong, as uh, Ho Fang has uh, kindly introduced me. I'd like to thank her before we begin, Ho Fang, for believing in me, believing in this collection, that uh, I could pull it off, even though you know, there were times I was doubtful if I could do it. Now, the book is inspired by a series of real-life cases of missing people. Now, the trigger for it was when, in 2009, I read a report in the Straits Times that every year, apparently, 3,000 people in Singapore disappear. Now, Crime Library is the non-profit organization that helps people to find missing people. And we came up with this startling, staggering uh, st statistic. 3,000 people disappear every year, of which 90% are often found or trace, but that leaves kind of 300 people unaccounted for. Now in small dinky Singapore where no corner is left untouched, it's quite hard to believe that 300 people will just disappear like that. So that left a lot of intriguing question marks for me as a writer. And in my poetry, if you're familiar with it, I like to explore absences and disappearances. You know, for example, uh, a loved one's reminiscences of a lover who has gone away or disappeared or a love that has died. So I'm intrigued by this question, who are these people, why and how do they disappear? And I wasn't quite, I wasn't that keen on exploring or speculating why they disappear, but also the idea of disappearance itself the theme of why we vanish, even though we may sometimes be physically present. Yeah. So, <coughs> as part of my research, I had to go to the police force website, and here's a little sample of it. And I chose the, the website for ideas. I pulled out some of these uh, faces and used them as a creative trigger to stimulate the imagination to come up with a story, a backstory, an idea, perhaps a little bit to move and hook the imagination to come up with a story. So I'm going to read you a series of uh, short stories, excerpts from these short stories. The first one is titled The True Singapore Ghost Story. Of course the title is a ripoff of uh, Russell Lee's collection of ghost stories. And it's kind of inspired by a man who disappeared, I think, sometime in 2006 or 2007. And he... I think he was formerly a mental patient. Even though Wong had been sitting at the bus stop for hours, no one seemed to have seen him. No one had noticed this 54-year-old man, slight of build and slightly stoop, hair grey at the fringe and sideburns, wearing a loose beige t-shirt, scruffy from the weather, and ash black pants. No one tried to sell him tissue packs. He did not have a scent on him anyway, and no one asked him for a light. It would not have ma mattered if someone had, for he had smoked his last stick years ago. 
Even the downpour, sudden as a wet kiss, poured through him as though he was merely a membrane. All that passers by could detect as they covered their noses with fingers or tissue paper was a pong they could not quite pin the sauce on. Wong himself was oblivious to all this, of course, since he was dead. Yes, strange as it might sound, dead. According to the Collins Colville English Dictionary, 4th edition, a person, animal or plant that is dead is no longer living. This would, technically speaking, describe Wong to a T, for he had already ceased living many years ago. He was dead to the world, and the world, to all intent and purpose, was dead to him. It was not always like this. There was a time when life had held something dear to him, when a day could be bookended by meetings and a month by paychecks and bonuses. Though he came from a poor family and his education had grounded to a halt at all levels, Wong was ambitious and astute. I want to make big money for you, Ma, he used to say to May. For a spell, Wong helped an army buddy run a small eatery in an industrial estate, but it had to be closed down because business was intermittent. Then he segued into selling vehicle spare parts. That too did not last when he was caught smooching the boss's daughter. In fact, Wong seemed to hop between women as regularly as jobs. If you plotted and examined the trajectories of his work and love lives, you would find the two surprisingly entwined, as though they were a pair of lovers unable to endure the time apart. You could speculate, of course, on this phenomenon, since Wong himself would not be able to offer anything coherent by way of an explanation. Perhaps to his mind, certain jobs required the death company of certain women. It would not do, for example, for the CEO of a multinational company to be seen with a woman whose day job was a toilet cleaner. Society simply was not built and stratified like that. Your companion reflected your station in life, and your station in life assumed the concrete form of your companion. No two ways about it. Wong must have instinctively understood this principle of social climbing, brought up in a country proud and loud, that you could climb as loftily as your ambition allowed. The day Wong began dying was the day the global financial markets crashed, dived to depths that would be recorded in history as Black Friday. Surely an understatement, if ever there was one. It was more like black death. But the TikTok close of the trading day, Wong had lost close to $18 million. Not just his own money, but his clients in unauthorized trading. But it would be another few years for his death to be obvious as bit by bit, flick by flick, his world fell away from him. Thank you very much. Uh, if, you, if you will pardon me, occasionally I would uh, interrupt the reading with spasms of coughing. I'm still trying to recover from flu. So that story is about a zombie, someone who buys into the rhetoric of uh, the Singapore story that you can climb as loftily as you can, and he suffers the consequences of it. Yeah. So the next story I will get my son to read, Ryan. It's... Uh, inspired by a missing boy about 16 years old and the intriguing thing about him was that when he was uh, found to have disappeared he was wearing a brazil t-shirt a brazil jersey so here he goes this is called because i tell <clears throat> dada takes me one time to the national stadium to watch a football game 
So many people sit side by side, like taking a test. They shout, go! I think football is a fun game because people can shout. When I play with Che Che at home one time and we shout, Mama scolds. She says, you shout so loud for what? You want to wake up the dead, is it? I hear many, many people shout in the national stadium and I think they must wake up the dead. I ask Dada where the dead. He sighs and says, the team that cannot score the goals. I shout, goal, but people look at me. Dada laughs and says, not yet, there was only an offside. I shout, goal, only when Dada shouts, goal. He kisses my head. When the football game finishes, the man next to Dada shakes his head, shakes his hand. I see he gives Dada money. I am scared of this man. He is short with yellow hair and he has a painting of dragons on his right arm. The dragons grow bigger when he moves his arm. He smokes many, many times and comes to my house many, many times. He says to Dada, next week, more. Dada tells me to keep a secret. Then we take bus number 16 to Lucky Plaza and he buys me a yellow Brazil t-shirt. He also has a Brazil t-shirt. I wear number 11 and he wears number 10. He says Brazil is his favorite team because he makes money. One time when they win the World Cup. I ask who drinks from the World Cup. He laughs loud and says, only God and Brazil can drink from the World Cup. I think God must be very thirsty because he has to share the cup with Brazil. When we get home, Mama asks Dada where he gets money to buy Ben a Brazil t-shirt. I say, the dragon man gives Dada money. Then Mama shouts at Dada and he shouts back. They shout for a long time. They throw things on the floor. Mama throws his favorite cup. Dada throws my favorite cup. I am scared and I cry. And now I cannot drink from my cup. Chechea takes me to the bedroom and closes the door. She says, why do you have to tell Mama? See what you did. I say, I forget it's a secret. Chechea says, you always forget. You know, this is not the first time they fight over money. Yet, you purposely told Mama. You want Mama and Dada to break up, is it? I say, I do not want Mama and Dada to break up. Chechea says, then why can't you keep your big mouth shut? Why didn't you say your friend in school gave you the t-shirt? I say, my friend in school does not have money to buy a Brazil t-shirt for me. Chechea says, I do not know what to do with you. You are born stupid. You will always be stupid. I say, I am not stupid. I keep secrets. I never tell Mama Cheche takes Terence one time to her bedroom. I never tell Mama Terence kisses Cheche and holds her on the bed. I never tell Mama Terence tickles Cheche and they wear no clothes and they laugh loud. Cheche hits my face. She shouts, You have been peeping at me? You pervert! She goes out of the house but forgets to take her keys. She must go to Terence's house. I cry and I put a pillow on my pain. Too many, many secrets to keep. Thank you for that. Thank you. So as you would have guessed by now, the little boys, uh, the little boy, well not little, the teenage boy is mentally challenged. So he speaks in that kind of uh, simple language. Now the next story is <coughs> titled The Little Drama Boy. It's about a band, uh, a band drummer who is a sex addict. Anyone below 21 here? Hi. You may, <laughs> uh, you may cheerfully leave the room. Well, uh, this boy, this man grew up um, having a very promiscuous mother. So he is not quite tuned in to what sex is, at least at this stage of his development as a boy. But he's, he's born to drum, he has this knack of drumming. So here it goes. Drumming kept me still in my room whenever I could not contain what I could not understand. Whenever Uncle Peter, Mom's first boyfriend, a few years after Dad's disappearance, shook my wall. Yes, yeah, straight baby. I would hear him hissing the headboard thumping against my wall till it built itself into a crescendo. You feel so good. And the harder the rhythm moaned and the voices groaned, the harder I drummed, using my feet to create a bad beat to his 4-4 beat. When it finally ended with a dull ache of silence, I would watch my fingers move, tapping, without the urgency of a song. Mom would behave the next morning as if nothing had happened. Why was it so noisy in your bedroom last night, Mom? 
I asked innocently. Oh, Uncle Peter is helping Mom move furniture. She replied, a wry, mysterious smile crossing her face. At 32, she still had her youth and radiance about her. Big boned and busty, she would often wear her hair in curls and her tank tops low. He is a very strong man. But when I peeped into her bedroom later, nothing seemed to have been moved. Her bed was still leaning against the wall adjacent to mine. The vanity table was still at the far corner, an arm stretched from the window. A few months later, it was Uncle John who Mum brought home after work. He was secretly adept at moving Mum's furniture around her room to a wowsy 3-4 beat. I did not even know what he looked like because he would tiptoe in when it was way past my bedtime and disappear just before dawn, like a vampire. Mom said he needed to catch up on sleep since he was a bouncer. Oh, he bounced to our place for a while, but another few months later, it was another faceless man Mom had probably met as a bar hostess, another nameless face that was not explained.